Good afternoon, evening, everyone. I am Tanya Rana. I'm a researcher at the Accountability Initiative of the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. Um, my colleagues, Ritvik Shukla and Avni Kapoor, and I co-wrote this paper on needs analysis for women's safety schemes in public spaces in India, uh, where we look at how many facilities it will take and how much it will cost to provide shelter facilities to victims of uh, violence in public spaces in India. I look forward to our discussion and also your suggestions to taking this work forward. So to set out a brief context um, and before diving into the core of this paper, it is important to think about how violence against women in India manifests and how it is also recorded. Firstly, violence is an overlapping phenomenon which implies that one form of violence does not preclude another kind of violence. For example, sexual violence can also occur with emo emotional violence. Secondly, and this is also relevant to our paper's methodology, which is that violence against women is different from crime against women or reported cases of violence as per the Crime in India uh, report of uh, National Crime Records Bureau. So violence against women is an instance of violence and crime against women is when that instance of violence gets reported. So violence against women, as I also said before, it's, it's interrelated, it's, it's broader. Um, in fact, some estimates suggest that as many as 99% cases of sexual violence in India go, go unreported. And thirdly, because violence is not reported, it can prevent redressal through existing formal channels. This might happen because women may themselves be unaware of these sites. Um, so for example, a World Bank survey from last year said that over 75% of uh, women commuters in Bombay were not aware of the women uh, helpline number. Redressal might also not happen because of low faith in justice system. Something that um, Sarojini ma'am also uh, mentioned uh, during her presentation is that it can take anywhere between two to 28 days um, in Uttar Pradesh for a woman to file uh, an FIR uh, of violence against uh, her. And it can also be because victims or survivors of violence might not have any alternate support system, forcing them to go back to their perpetrators. So all of this combined contributes to underreporting of uh, violence against women. So what were the objectives of our paper? Why did we do this needs analysis for women's safety schemes in India? We wanted to estimate the number of victims of violence given underreporting in crimes and the facilities needed to accommodate these victims. We also wanted to determine the costs for financing these facilities through two women's safety schemes called the One Stop Center and Shakti Sadhan of the Ministry of Women and Child Development for the financial year of 21-22. Once we determined these costs, we compared it to the latest budgetary allocations for these two schemes. So the usefulness of such a costing exercise that it, it tells us the gaps in financing and at the same time it can progressively allow policymakers to better plan and budget uh, for such government schemes. So the next obvious question becomes, why did we only choose One Stop Center and Shakti Sadhan? But before I get into that, I want to briefly mention the scheme reclassification exercise that the Ministry of Women and Child Development undertook in 21-22 uh, for its schemes of safety and empowerment of women. So the mission for protection and empowerment of women was reclassified into the mission Shakti in 21-22. And this mission Shakti was further divided into the sub-scheme of Sambal for safety and security and Samartya for empowerment of women. So several schemes like Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao, Working Women Hostel, PMMVY, Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana, which is a maternity benefit scheme, they all existed as standalone schemes before being clubbed into these broad sub-schemes. And what this resulted in is, is that now we don't have standalone budgetary allocations for them. They're all clubbed under Sambal and Samartha. So we don't know how much money these schemes individually get. So as you can see on your screens, uh, One Stop Center is a part of Sambal uh, and Shakti Sadhan is a part of uh, Samartha. So now coming back to our question on why One Stop Center and Shakti Sadhan, we selected these schemes as they provide similar kinds of services to uh, survivors of violence. These schemes provide rescue and redressal services uh, by providing shelter facilities and medical or legal assistance, etc., to them. And these two schemes operate after the incidence of violence. And by doing this, we have, in our way, attempted to contribute to the broader literature on women's access to public spaces and the state's role in making these spaces accessible for them. 
In fact, these two schemes also have a common pool of resources for legal aid and uh, psychosocial counseling, and victims can choose to go to either of these facilities. The difference, however, in terms of the number of days of uh, redressal provision. Uh, so for example, the OSC, a, a victim can take shelter in an OSC for not more than five days. In the case of Shakti Sadhan, uh, a victim can stay for a maximum period of three years, but there is a limit to how many victims can access this space. Only 50 victims per Shakti Sadhan, and this is something that we will come to when we discuss the methodology of our paper and the way that we uh, arised at are uh, costing estimates. Okay, so of course there are implementation challenges with pe which people have studied before uh, for these um, shelter uh, facilities. So reports suggest that several women lack awareness about the location of a one-stop center in their district, for example. Vacancies of staff like psychosocial counselors or even lacking medical supplies at such facilities can impact redressal of um, services. Another m important reason for lacking implementation is because of inadequate fi finances, as you can see on the figure towards your right. So utilization of allocated monies has only decreased for all the three schemes since 2018-19 uh, to 2021. In fact, if you see, OSC present presents a very interesting situation in which utilizations for 2018-19 were far greater uh, than the allocations made. But in 2020-21, even though allocations were much higher than those in 2018-19, utilizations were only 42% of those allocations. So what this says is clearly there was a demand for the scheme. We can see that it happened in 2018-19, but that demand progressively, it's subdued for XYZ reasons, and, and we can see that in, uh, in how the monies were allocated. Ujula is that uh, gas cylinder. No, no, no. Ujwala is, this was a scheme for trafficking of uh, victims. This is an M MWCD scheme. No, it's a union scheme. Yeah, it used to be. So Swadhar Gray and um, Ujwala were merged. No, 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 no. That is Pradhan Mantri Ujwala Yojana. It's a part of uh, Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gases um, scheme. So that's a subsidy, fuel subsidy scheme. Yes, it did. That it did. I want to make that thing because they didn't have to make an allocation. So yeah, but the allocations funds. were so shown separately. Annually, yeah, yeah, but yeah. But they already had a pot of funds. Yes, yes, yes. All right. So coming to the methodology of our paper, so we started off by describing these schemes and selecting gender-based violence victims in public spaces, um, as per NCRB's data from 2021. Then we used MWCD's reported data on the victims who sought redressal um, under both these schemes in 2021. For Shakti Sadhan, we combined MWCD's reported data for Swadhar Gray and Ujwala because Shakti Sadhan only came about recently when Swadhar Gray and Ujwala were merged. And then we calculated proportion of women seeking redressal under these two schemes and used that estimate uh, to see how many women will need each of these schemes. And then we followed this up by using different levels of percentage of under-reporting to see the extent to which MWCD missed providing these facilities to women. There is no clear evidence on one uh, number of under-reporting, and that is why we used a range. While doing this, we added another variable. Uh, it was National Family Health Survey's wealth quintile data to consider only those women who may need these schemes in the least wealthy households. This, of course, is due to the assumption that women in higher wealth quintiles have better access to institutions of justice because of favorable geographical, social, and economic conditions. And at the same time, this data assumes that um, decision making of household finances, women also play an equal part in household finances decision making, which cannot be true or may not be true. And then we looked at the unit costs, uh, which were mentioned in the scheme guidelines for both of these schemes. And lastly, we estimated needs for the facilities that were required using figures that we calculated uh, for uh, the estimated victims. Um, and then we also calculated the to be constructed facilities, which is nothing but the difference between these required facilities versus um, existing facilities. So for example, if um, we require five facilities, but they there are only three facilities that exist for an OSC or a, a Shakti Sadhan, there would be two more facilities that would have to be constructed 
in that state. And then we multiply this by the unit cost that we calculated through the scheme guidelines um, and came up with an overall cost for scheme provision under One Stop Center and Shakti Sadhan for the financial year 21-22. Now, the limitations of our paper. Two broad limitations in the study as for scheme-related services and available data. For scheme-related services, we have assumed that MWC reported victims in 2021 are over 18 years of age. Um, scheme benefits, however, are also extended to girls, but since the data is not disaggregated by age, it was difficult for us to determine how many of them might be girls. So we went through with this assumption that they were over 18 years of age. Secondly, we cannot say that women may be availing all of the facilities from legal to shelter to um, taking medical help at uh, the one-stop center or uh, Shakti Sadhan. For example, women may only be seeking counseling services and not really the shelter facility. There are data constraints too. We have assumed unit costs for all states and UTs to be the same because states do not come, come out with their own uh, unit costs. It's also a union level scheme, so they technically cannot. Um, and um, several states and union territories also do not report uh, their releases and utilizations because of which we could not compare budgetary allocations state-wise for um, all these schemes. Using NCRB data also presented an interesting statistical limitation in the way that crime against women data is collected in India. So NCRB follows the principal offense rule and as per this rule, crime is reported as per the maximum penalty under the Indian Penal Code. So for example, dowry death attracts a greater penalty than cruelty by husbands or relatives. And all of this contributes to underestimating needs and progressively costs. Lastly, we have, we have assumed the same level of underreporting for all crime against women in public spaces for the study, which may not be true. It is not necessary that kidnapping um, would be similarly underreported as sexual violence, for example. Now I'd like to take you through some of our key findings. So as per this graph, on the x-axis, we have different levels of underreporting. So you can see different levels of underreporting from 1% all the way to 49 to 50%. Um, and on the y-axis, we have estimated victims under One Stop Center and Shakti Sadhan. So two key points to note here. Estimated victims in the bottom wealth quintiles, I'd mentioned that we added this variable of women needing assistance only in the least wealthy households. Um, and this, in this case, we also considered rural households. Um, so estimated victims in the bottom wealth quintiles are directly proportional to the rate of underreporting. So there are more victims or survivors of violence as there is an increase in the rate of underreporting. And the number of estimated victims under OSC, One Stop Center, are far greater than Shakti Sadhan. This could be because MWCD also ended up reporting more survivors going to an OSC, which was over 1.5 lakh in 21-22, and only over 10,000 uh, precisely 9,792 victims in the case of Shakti Sadhan for 21-22. And this pattern might also exist because there are more existing OSC facilities. Um, this could also mean that women are demanding shorter term stay than a longer term stay which a Shakti Sadhan provides. But there is no evidence to suggest one or the other. So if we only look at underreporting of crime against women at over 50% and consider only women in the bottom wealth quintile in rural areas, we find that One Stop Center and Shakti Sadhan missed more than 3.5 lakh and over 50,000 victims of violence under One Stop Center and Shakti Sadhan respectively in 2021. I will repeat this, One Stop Center and Shakti Sadhan missed more than 3.5 lakh and over 50,000 victims of, of, of violence in 2021. For representation purposes, again, uh, this figure shows two levels of underreporting, one at 30%, which we have considered as a minimum level of underreporting, and another at 90%, which is maximum underreporting. And in both case cases, we have estimated victims in the bottom three wealth quintiles as per uh, the National Family Health Survey. So looking specifically at one-stop centers statewide, we see the highest difference between women covered by MWC MWCD and women who may have needed assistance um, in Uttar Pradesh, followed by Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. In fact, Uttar Pradesh also recorded, I think, over 13% of overall crime against women in India as per the latest NCRB figures, which is the highest. So according to uh, Women and Child Development Ministry's recent guidelines on Mission Shakti, 300 new 
one stop centers are to be constructed um in the coming years based on our estimations at the minimum over 202 facilities need to be constructed but at the maximum level of under reporting mwcd will have to construct as many as 13459 facilities and this is clearly nowhere close to the 300 uh, figure mark coming to shakti sadan we see that the highest gap exists for west bengal odisha and karnataka unlike one stop center shakti sadan's need needs for facilities are far greater than one stop centers the number of facilities that need to be constructed even at a minimum level of 30% of under reporting for women is 573 which is far more than the number of existing facilities um one reason for such high needs might also be because several states have never built a shakti sadan bihar and haryana for example do not have a shakti sadan uh, west bengal in fact does not have a one stop center now since shakti sadan is meant for long term redressal whereas one stop center is for short term for only 5 days victims do not have a choice to seek shelter in either of these facilities uh, nearby and this has the potential to undermine needs so broadly the trends in estimated victims and facilities suggest that a greater number of victims are going to one stop center than shakti sadan one reason could be as i said greater number of uh, one stop centers than shakti sadans but what can this also imply based on existing literature so studies have suggested that this might point to women's low propensity to te- to seek some low or no redressal um, against violence against them women tend to go back to abusive households because of lacking alternate support which we know prompts under reporting too so they might be seeking quick redressal if any through one stop centers and since one stop centers only allow for a 5 day stay or redressal period period it is interesting to see that our findings do reflect um some of what the existing literature corresponds to looking at some comparing union budgetary allocations with our costs so we looked at allocations from 2020 2021 because uh, stand alone allocations were did, were not reported after 21 22 since the schemes were merged um and um we combined allocations for swadhar grah and ujwala again to see to compare cost to compare it with costs for shakti sadan um and overwhelmingly generally this table shows that the costs for required and to be constructed facilities are much greater than the allocations made at higher levels of under reporting they're even e- even greater okay conclusion and way forward so the immediate conclusion <laughs> of our finding is that mwcd has under underestimated needs and finances for one stop center and shakti sadan for financial year 2122 21, and what does this majorly imply the lack of adequate one stop centers and shakti sadan suggests that victims are not being able to seek redressal through these government schemes in a situation where one stop centers are constrained with low accessibility and awareness most victims trying to seek support through these centers are probably not receiving it low redressal correspondingly leads to a situation of low spending and even lower allocations progressively because governments have competing priorities and governments will not increase allocations if in a situation of limited absorptive capacity so if you think of the figure that i had shown originally how uh, utilizations for one stop centers declined by 100 percentage point mark from 142% to 42% in 21 22 2020 21 it just shows that that has played out and can play out and this can further under reporting as women will be discouraged from reporting instances of violence against them it is a cyclical process in fact a study aligns with existing debates for the need of such crisis centers in public spaces existence of crisis centers like one stop center and shakti sadan can aid the creation of gender transformative public spaces um, in the country and lastly and this is born out of a limitations as well is that there is an urgent need to understand how these facilities operate at the grassroots as we know patriarchy can also pervade existing formal channels of redressal of violence against women With that I will end the presentation. Thank you so much for your patience. So this is a presentation by Krishna um and they'll be she'll be presenting on the work that they have done with respect to recording experiences of women of uh, girls and women in rural spaces which I think sometimes is an understudied area when we engage with public spaces. So um I'll just briefly talk about uh Swati Swati I I'll, I'll be referring to my notes so I can cover 
most of it. Swati is an organization which started in 1994 with an initiative of working with women on health, uh, health sectors concerning to gender-based violence. And they had initiated a rural women's movement where in the, the movement was for the, for the woman, by the woman and of the woman. And it involved developing women's leadership. We co-started working with six community co uh, initiatives and we have two pilot initiatives. Uh, so while we were we were in the phase of working in 2000 in 2021, uh, we tried researching our data on you know understanding you know violence that is happening in rural spaces. And while we were searching, we realized that there is no data which is available in rural spaces. The only data that is uh, available, the systematic data was only for the urban spaces. The sexual violence that occurs in, in, uh, amongst women and girls in India. And it is, I mean, the last data that was available was in NH NHFS 4 with a comparison of 5.9 to 9.6 in rural women and girls in India for sexual violence. So um, we started with this project called No Fear. You can, you can very well see it's a pun that to know, to have no fear, you should know your fear. So uh, the project is implemented in two districts of Gujarat, uh, Patri and Mysagar, and it fosters the freedom of freedom from violence and safety for women and girls in public spaces. The project aims to mobilize to claim the demands of women and girls uh, through citizenship rights and. Um, and the local, I mean, good governance uh, while uh, getting them connected to panchayats and prioritize and respond to women facing women and girls facing violence. So, uh, the study that I'm going to present is going to be a data that was collected in collaboration with GIDR and Swati in 2021, and um, the paper is descriptive. It is not a comparison analysis between both the blocks. We have been trying to capture the um, capture the public space violence that is happening to adolescent girls in these both the villages, and it is a multi-phase selection selection sample where uh, where the tot uh, the total sample size is to 527, and uh, intervention is done through empowerment data on the determinants if at all at later if the data is available or not. So the methodology that we adopted was we had 26 project villages and 17 villages were from Santrampur and nine villages, Santrampur that is Mysagar district and nine villages from Patri that is Surendranagar district. The data was collected randomly, through, uh, randomly it was, uh, and um, it was the CAPI tool was used that is computer assisted personal interviewing tool. As I said, the sample size was 527. Patri had 186 adolescent girls, and uh, Santrampur had 341 girls from age, age limit of 14 to 19 years. So we, we tried understanding how it has started. So how, how they are actually limiting themselves of not going to, I mean, why, why, why they are not going for the uh, further education. So we realized that ar around 39% in Patri and 20% in Sandrampur were not going to school due to the fear of concerns and safety, safety issues as well as they were not <laughs> interested in studies. Going further, the reasons behind dropping out was the major, one of the major, I'm not sure if you can read the data, but I'll read it. 13% of girls uh, said that they had concerns for safety, and 35% of girls said that they were not interested in studies. While they were saying this thing, not interested in studies, somewhere down the line, they did have the concern of stepping out of the village because the, the schools after eight standard, the schools, the primary education is available in the school, but going beyond eight standard, one needs to travel a lot outside the houses, outside the villages. So the schools are 15 kilometers away, public transport is not available, the places are deserted. 
so these were some of the hidden reasons that they were not able to show their concern at that point of time so um the while we were trying to understand that w if at all violence had occurred with them so at least 38% had had uh, experienced at least one one sort of sexual violence in their villages actually and um, it was it was even it was reported to the uh, it was reported to the police station but from this there were even chances that the fir were not lost in these cases then uh, the types of sexual violence that they had experienced the majority of the adolescent girls had answered that 66% of them had experienced staring and 31% of them had been experiencing verbal abuse so um, perception about being unsafe you know it is very interesting to know actually they you they they said that 51% of the girls was were uh, were scared to go in fairs because you know they were afraid of getting uh, getting abused but w they have also said that 43% were scared to go to cinemas but when we actually asked them that do you even go to cinemas and they were like no but we feel that it is unsafe because there are larger groups of men present over there so it this th that is the main thing that it is their perception like they feel that this is unsafe rather than and that's why they avoid going to this place and marking marking them as unsafe actually so here comes the geography of violence uh the geography of violence when um it's 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 mostly in the market space that they experience a lot of a uh, lot of violence that is i 24% is uh, verbal abuse then um 40% i mean somebody even so this data was captured by their personal interview while they were using the tablet they were using the tablet and uh, filling in the data so they felt more comfortable in expressing themselves and while we were asking the questions they did not open up but while we inter while we asked the questions on the tablet flashing was one of the major reasons that they were afraid moving on to the roads for uh, uh, i mean they were scared because um, they were facing such kind of sexual violence at the in the village premises too adolescent girls reason for believing public space was unsafe one of the major reasons was that men loiter around like because men are loitering around they feel quite unsafe and uh, another reason like uh, sarojini ma'am also said that infrastructure like travel infrastructure like street light i mean those spaces are such that i don't think except for highways they have even a street lighting over there so it it is a very deserted road it is a very dangerous road i mean um, women are not welcomed at many places so there is there is this uh there is this chok it the uh, choraya there is a there is a circle where only men can sit if a woman comes over there so it's it's like it becomes a talking point that why she sitting sitting over there so you know it's like uh the public spaces are hidden i mean the places which are hidden from the public areas also they feel unsafe about it types of sexual harassment and the perpetrators and uh, they were facing was 76% so 76% strangers showed that they were staring and most of it you can see that it is the perpetrators are the strangers actually who have been um, abusing the adolescent girls for which they get scared to step out of their villages so the neighbor uh, in some places the neighbors are, so neighbors are also the uh, people who abuse the girls so this is one interesting fact like uh, the girl uh, swati had started bus service for school going girls because they had dropped out and it so happened that uh, the person in the bus itself abused the girl so the whole village the whole village stopped the idea of going to the for it further education and all the girls dropped out of the village so you know when we are trying to make such interventions for the girls it happens that it um, creates a lot of problem for them only to go further with certain interventions
so who perpetrates in the public spaces it's like most of it it is the strangers like 70% it is staring verbal abuse again 70% and stalking is 61% so the highest highest amount of abuse is done by strangers and what would be the response to the violence like when we ask the girls that what do you do the most common answer that we got was they leave the place they do not report they leave the place and this is common in both the spaces patri and maisagar that um, they they did not feel safe and and also they were worried to go back and tell their parents because their mobility would have been restricted so they don't report they don't speak about it and they don't think that any further interventions are required in such kind of scenarios so what are the i mean the conclusion is that that co- the conclusion in the recommendations are that that people are not even aware about being sexually violated i mean the girls are not aware about being sexually violated and i think we need to break the culture of silence over here and talk about it more then the school especially it affects the school school um, i mean the girls who are going to the school who want to pursue higher education they are feeling oppressed and they don't continue they don't continue their schooling because of the abuse that they are facing actually so you know getting back into a formal system like where they can feel safe the, where they can uh, where they can go ahead with schooling again some kind of a policy formal policy which can be taken care of within the so um rajasthan go, uh, gram panchayats have started with girl friendly panchayat it is shaping up to certain extent and certain villages are showing progress but that kind of a model needs to get replicated everywhere actually it is for beti badao beti bachao beti padhao andolan but you know s- such kind of programs do not get uh, visibilized in the um, in this kind of space so i think if they are encouraged more if they are replicated in some other states and everything it makes a lot of difference then second thing is like um, well, after this uh, after this research we started we started engaging girls into certain kind of activities which involved physical and mental awareness like for example sports we started with kabaddi is one of the national sports that, so uh, they can have the platform where they can showcase their talent they can and these girls have participated at district level they have participated at state level and they have created their own identity and um, we also have uh, realized that creating community influencers in the village creates a lot of uh, creates a lot of uh, talking point for the uh, talking points for the adolescent girls where they come to speak to that woman and they feel safe to discuss their or uh, they feel safe to discuss their um, problems and everything so i think a community leader a woman leader or a community influencer works quite well and lastly the most important thing i think government needs to improve on safety measures like what we said like the infrastructure like even the roads are not proper even the transport facilities like to get a transport you have to walk 15 kilometers outside the village so which woman is going to feel safe about it and uh, there are no street lights like after 6 o'clock there is hardly something visible over there so you know such kind and they need to raise these concerns so if they till they don't raise these concerns that awareness needs to get created so that is what i think is something that needs to be done everywhere and plus um, i think the uh, research data on rural a uh, rural public space violence needs to be highlighted a lot because it it doesn't exist it is very rare on the internet so more research needs to be done on that lines and those of you who would like to sort of talk to her more further with respect to the sports initiative because swati's initiative with kabaddi has actually been we've been on the ground uh, looking at some of the um uh, girls who are influenced by you know who have been part of the kabaddi tournaments and uh it the in, the results are quite interesting and the kinds of conversations that they having around uh you know we all know about girls in sports and how that actually really helps not just with claiming of public spaces which is one thing but also claiming of certain forms of identity and how girls are using really innovative strategies 
to be able to participate, to kind of push back against social norms and mores. So if anyone wants to kind of follow up on the kind of work that Swati is doing with Kabaddi, I would encourage you to kind of talk to her. She's here for the next two days. Uh, it's quite interesting work, and we've been sort of first witnesses to it. So that's uh, actually our privilege as well. Uh, so we next is Mansi Singh, who will be talking to us actually from, the, uh, I think, something quite significant in terms of uh, also something that Sarojini has been, um, had addressed in her um, uh, presentation um, with respect to what does the state, how the state perceives gender identity. And what I really found, which I've kind of also spoken to her uh, or written to her about, is that the state I mean, although she's engaged with primarily the transgender identity, which is, I think, also very significant also because it's understudied and not really well known, uh, but also it provides us an insight into how state engages with gender identity in general, right? So how do we, um, because it provides us also a kind of a reflection on how we see sort of the way in which gender identity is formed and framed and um, what forms of sexuality is associated with certain kinds of normalization and certain forms of invisibilization of privilege more than anything else, right? So the hypervisibilization as well is, um, is something that uh, can also be discriminatory in some, some form, something that she will highlight in her presentation. So over to you, Mansi. Hello, everyone. I am Mansi Singh. I'm the senior research associate at the Center for Law and Policy Research. Um, I work on policy and legal research on gender rights with a focus on trans rights, uh, caste and disability rights, and on the issues of equality and non-discrimination with a focus on intersectionality. Uh, through my master's dissertation and my work at CLPR for the past two and a half years, I've engaged deeply with the legal framework on the rights of transgender persons. Um, I've also learned immensely from my colleagues, clients, and collaborators who identify as trans or gender non-conforming folks. Uh, with that introduction about myself, I will now move on to the, uh, the presentation. This is not based on a study like uh, some of my co-panelists here. This is based on a lot of work that we do as part of litigation uh, and you know, seeing how uh, laws affect uh, trans persons. And I've tried to keep myself very limited to the public spaces, uh, livelihoods with two modes of income in particular, so that I dive deep and properly into it as opposed to casting my net wide and not being able to cover things with the nuances. So uh, through this paper, I've attempted to look at the legal framework that regulates the rights of gender and sexual minorities. As we know, um, trans people and gender variant persons face discrimination and exclusion in most spaces, but it's in public avenues, such as the roads, parks, public transport, toilets, that this uh, discrimination, this visibility, and the abuse is most heightened. Um, in some part due to societal perceptions of the professions uh, that they most commonly engage in, such as arms collection like Badai and Mangti, uh, and sex work, um, and, some due to, and in some part due to state policies, these avenues have, become, have been historically unsafe, uh, while also being very crucial for survival of the trans persons. Um, these spaces and the policies uh, can demonstrate violent power dynamics between the state and society on one hand and gender minorities on the other. I first look at the, uh, the livelihoods that they engage in, then the judicial pronouncements on the rights of gender and sexual minorities. I look at the vocabulary with, uh, against the post-colonial view that this vocabulary uses, uh, the laws, the language of the law. Uh, how the laws can be used to abuse uh, the gender variant persons in public spaces and the implications it has on these persons. Okay, context. Um, everyone here has already seen, um, you know, trans persons at streetlights or maybe at, you know, at one of at the at the. Uh, at a wedding or the, when a newborn is, uh, you know, is being celebrated at home, and we see the marginalization of how the how the, how we meet out the treatments to them. Uh, this becomes very heightened when it comes to the state authorities or law enforcement agencies such as the police. Uh, there's stigma, but also multiple forms of violence, ranging from sexual to economic to physical. Coming to the historical exclusion, it has meant that there are very few forms of trade and livelihood that have, uh, you know, been left to trans persons, which now have 
been limited, I mean, at least in the informal spaces, are limited to begging, sex work, or collecting money. When we look at sex work, for instance, uh, it is a major source of livelihood for many trans persons. Um, as there appears to be a demand for sex with hijra, many have adapted to it in order to earn a living. This is all based on uh, Serena Nanda's uh, ethnographic work on uh, the hijra lives. Um, there was a book out in 1999 and then again in 2005. Uh, there are many challenges, of course, to unregulated sex work. Uh, but so, for instance, many sex workers do not have control over their working conditions. They cannot dictate rates, hours, or place, have limited uh, decision making when it comes to the use of condoms, and thus are highly vulnerable to sexually transmitted diseases, uh, infections, HIV, and AIDS. Um, moreover, they often uh, face abuse and harassment from police, pimps, and goons. Now, there are two things to consider when it comes to trans uh, sex workers. Firstly, the visibility of transness and gender nonconformity, both in their biological selves and then their uh, expressions of gender. So sartorially, through their expressions, through their mannerisms, marks them as easy prey for harassment. Second, many trans persons end up leaving their abusive homes um, because uh, unlike the other queer groups who can pass off as straight in society, a uh, trans person cannot. And if their uh, home or family ends up being as abusive, they, ha they have to leave that house. Um, so trans persons, especially from the poorer socioeconomic backgrounds, actually lack the support of their families and social networks, which then, which then makes them more vulnerable to this kind of harassment, this, this violence and brutality, compared to the female sex workers and to the other queer groups that may be cisgender. Other forms, uh, other common modes of income for some of the trans identities, not all of them, uh, such as the hijra, include Badai and Manti. Uh, these uh, these uh, are you know, arms collections that are done in lieu of performing rituals of blessings, songs, and dances at auspicious uh, occasions, such as weddings and childbirth, but also spill over to the public spaces as begging at uh, traffic lights, market areas, and public parks. You know, during this, these collections, uh, trans persons may call out loudly to passers-by, to the vendors in the vicinity, be openly heteronormative through their voices, appearance, expressions, manner of dressings. Um, and these are important to note as I come to the section, second section of the paper, which looks at how the law offers little protection against this kind of non-heteronormative uh, expressions of self, and may in fact be twisted to harass uh, trans persons in public spaces. Coming to the judicial, I'm very quickly going to take you through the judicial advancements uh, because this is a very rights-based uh, approach that I'm taking towards uh, trans persons in public spaces. Um, these three uh, um, ju judgments that I look at uh, actually upheld the rights of trans persons and other sexual minorities to live with dignity, privacy, and expanded the grounds for non-discrimination to sexual or orientation and gender identity. The first one is the uh, landmark judgment NALSA in 2014, which recognized uh, gen gender identity as one of the most fundamental aspects of, a, of an individual's life and upheld that all uh, persons have the right to self-identify their gender. Further, it identified very, uh, different uh, trans groups as, uh, you know, Kotis, Hijras, Aravanis, they can identify as third gender without m medical intervention. Uh, further, it stated that non-recognition of this identity actually denies them equal protection, especially, and makes them especially vulnerable in public spaces to harassment, violence, of, and sexual assault. This is important because the Supreme Court is taking cognizance of how they are being treated in public spaces, especially by the state agencies themselves. In Justice uh, K.S. Puttaswamy versus Uni Union of India 20 2017, um, privacy was held as an, as an uh, unviolable attribute of human dignity, and uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation was uh, stated as deeply offensive to dignity and self-worth. So it expanded the uh, notion of what is uh, a ground for discrimination in this country and included sexual orientation as part of that. Then Navtej Singh Johar and others versus Union of India in 2018 partially read down Section 377 uh, and decriminalized same-sex relations between consenting adults. Uh, it also expanded the meaning of sex under Article 15 of the Constitution to gender identity and sexual orientation. This is also very important because uh, now a, a, a Supreme Court judgment such as this actually then paves way for, all, for the people's movement to take their demands and the uh, rights-based approach uh, forward. 
coming to the vocabulary of some of these uh, you know uh, some of these judgments section 377 of the ipc actually uses the phrase the phrase carnal intercourse against the order of nature to ban the same sex relations now naftej uh, actually challenged it stating that the there is the determination of the order of nature is not a constant phenomenon social morality also changes from age to age this is the opinion of the judges while uh, giving this judgment they prioritized the dignity and growth of the lgbtqi persons over the continuing uh, social outlook that has been derived from a different age when we come to the laws we'll see why they are talking about a different age here this is an important part uh, where I want to note that the st uh, the approach of the state has been more accommodating of the trans rights over the other LGBTQI uh, groups. For example, with the Navtej judgment, the court did not take a strong s stand on the rights of same-sex couples and left the repeal of the Section 377 to the legislature. On the other hand, central government continues to oppose the, legis uh, the legalization of same-sex relations while heeding the court's uh, directions in the Nalsa judgment. This is um, a member of parliament who has said this during the debate over the rights of transgender bills this is this was an earlier draft of the bill that was finally that finally became the transgender act in 2019 and uh, this is a policy maker who is saying that transgender is by nature and born that way and uh, it's and, and he differentiated differentiates it from unnatural sex so while one is a natural being the other is promoting something unnatural and that's why this kind of um, uh, you know, distinction happens between the trans groups and the other queer groups. Um, there is also the association of many trans identities with spirituality and religion. Uh, a lot of trans identities actually have, uh, uh, you know, associations with Lord Shiva as being, uh, you know, Ardha, uh, Nari, and um, others like Aravani and Jogappa, who are also, who feel very connected to Lord Shiva in some way. Um, so the visible, that is the bodily manifestation of the non-binary gender is grudgingly accepted while the invisible, which is the sexual orientation, is concealed under the socio-legal uh, morality that we see here. Okay, I come to the legal uh, framework, um, starting with 377, which we all know, uh, which was titled Unnatural Offenses. Uh, then comes the Criminal Tribes Act 18, uh, 1871. Now this uh, British colonial rule actually classified several tribes, including eunuchs in uh, courts, because that was the word that was used, as habitual criminals who by virtue of their birth are predisposed to committing crimes. And then section 26 of the act actually empowered the police to arrest without warrant any eunuch who dressed as a woman or wore ornaments or, play or danced or played music with the intention of being seen from a public place or street. You see how this has, this is 1871. This wasn't repealed until much later, and I will show you how this continues in some other laws uh, still. Uh, if this is the language that is being used as the law, which makes things legal as opposed to what is illegal, then we can see how it also affects the, the perceived uh, notions of trans people when it comes to the law enforcement agencies. Uh, when we look at the the Telangana Eunuch Act 1919. Uh, it replicates these definitions and provisions of the Criminal Tribes Act, and it continues these registers of eunuchs. The Section 7 actually of this act, I mean, there's suspicion, they, they can be arrested on suspicion of kidnapping or emasculating young boys. Um, section 5, in fact, penalizes any eunuch that may be found with the young boys. Uh, section 7 is the most incriminating in this language. It states that any person found to be emasculating themselves or another or a betting emasculation will be punished with imprisonment. Now why this is important? In a petition that has been ch uh, that has challenged this act in the uh, Hyderabad High Court, it has been argued that under this act, under this section in fact, police and state authorities are often found arresting trans persons in cases where they're found just merely singing, dancing, cross-dressing in public spaces, which are taken as emasculation of themselves. Uh, this legal, this language actually criminalizes trans persons on the basis of their mannerisms, their modes of income, sartorial senses, uh, so on and so forth. Moving on to the Moral Traffic Prevention Act, ITPA 1957. Uh, sec it was amended in 1986 to in uh, include a gender neutral language. And um, its enforcement is primary, primarily tra targeted to 
at the uh, person soliciting sex in public and can often be used by police and thugs for violence and extortion against trans persons. Uh, so as you see, uh, sections 3 to 8 actually focus on procuring, uh, on, on anyone procuring, soliciting or seducing a person for prostitution and section 7 penalizes prostitution in the vicinity of public spaces. Now when it comes to uh, section 8, it uses very vague language such as willful exposure of person, tempts or endeavors to tempt, uh, loiters, causes annoyance to residents, uh, offense, public decency. These are all, uh, you know, words that I've taken that are relevant to public spaces. Now, in this case, the modes of livelihood for trans persons, uh, which are sex work and arms collection, can then very easily be made out as an offense under this act, and it is by many law enforcement agencies, and um, makes them, and, and sometimes even no arrest uh, can happen. Maybe they're just using it to extort money from trans persons, just loitering in public spaces. Um, there are some cases that I have here that you know actually have used this uh, section uh, for registering under this act. Um, then we finally come to the be all of um, protection for trans persons. Um, the Transgender Persons Protection of Rights Act 2019. Uh, this uh, act of course gives the right to have self-perceived gender identity and uh, a trans person can now apply for a tr an identity card stating their chosen name and gender regardless of med uh, medical intervention. It prohibits discrimination and accessing any facilities and goods that are available to the general public. It states that very clearly. Uh, however, there are no provisions for reservations as has been directed by the Supreme Court. This is very crucial because uh, the Supreme Court did recognize them as a socio-economically backward classes uh, that require uh, reservations. It does not recognize the common modes of income that I have just uh, in li uh, you know, listed out, sex work and uh, begging or arms collection. And there is no regulatory framework for these workspaces that many, um, most trans persons are engaged in currently, uh, you know, which is public parks, streets, traffic lights. Uh, abuse of trans sex workers, as I had pointed out earlier, was, is actually worse than female tra trans workers. I've already made that point. Yet, the Act actually punishes it with a lesser uh, penalty. Section 18D penali penalizes physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal and emotional abuse, economic ex uh, abuse, with um, six months to two years with fine. Now, comparing this to Section 376 of the IPC, which deals with the sexual abuse of a cis woman, uh, that punishes the accused with a rigorous imprisonment of at least 10 years to life. And so by this act and the section 376, you can see that it's starkly discriminatory um, and violative of the constitutional equality of a trans person and a cis person. Um, and so what happens is the trans sex workers continue to remain as uh, vulnerable to sexual and other abuses as ever because this is not a, a solid deterrent. Second thing, now uh, the concept of familiar space has been, you know, uh, brought up a couple of times during this panel. What happens is uh, when, when uh, trans persons leave their own houses, uh, a lot of them may join a gharana uh, or a hijra household, which functions both as a residential unit and as a, an economic unit. Many hijras um, speak of the house as analogous to a family. Uh, what gharanas do is provide a roof over their heads, food, protection from police, strength in numbers in public spaces. That's very important. Uh, however, both the ITPA and uh, Section 18C of the TPA, so Section 2C of the, fa of the Trans Persons Act actually defines family as only the group of people that are related by blood or marriage or by adoption. That's often like you no know, family is actually a site of abuse for many trans persons as opposed to the family that they have chosen for themselves. Now, uh, this neglect uh, to include these social bonds as family, and on the other hand, under the ITPA, you know, anyone who's accused of running a brothel, which a lot of Ijra Gharanas can often be uh, accused of, uh, you know, in lieu of extortion of money, or just, uh, you know, plain threatening, can actually, can potentially criminalize the Gharanas themselves. And so it con the act continues to keep the trans persons without familial support and shelter and vulnerable to state uh, harassment. The conclusion is I was trying to show you how the poor understanding of the state, uh, of the trans persons by state actually leads them to little to no protection from the legal provisions or law enforcement agencies. Um, 
neither the legal provisions nor the law for, for enforcement agencies succeed in pro, uh, protecting trans persons in public spaces or otherwise. Many fighting for the trans rights believe that the emphasis on uh, means of livelihood of trans persons is crucial to the integration to the mainstream social order. Others have pushed for reservations um, uh, you know, in the fields of education and public employment as directed by uh, NALSA. Yet others are pushing for uh, horizontal reservations. Uh, there's an ongoing petition in the Supreme Court that takes cognizance of the intersectional identities of the gender of trans persons along with their caste, disability, and other uh, uh, identities. And these movements are slowly gaining hold in the academic, public, and lo legal discourses. Um, there's also a petition uh, that's ongoing for the inclusive um, accommodation of trans students in higher education uh, uh, higher educational institutions. That's Trinetra's case. And most recently, of course, there's a petition for the same-sex marriage in which trans persons have also been uh, have also filed their own petitions. So, uh, you know, when we are talking about rights-based approach, we find that when the law itself does not understand you or is used to kind of uh, as used as a weapon against you the own one of the few avenues is to have a rights based approach through the courts which have as i showed through the judicial uh, pronouncements which have taken a more understanding view of trans identities and given rights that were then used to enact laws and push for the people's movements and push for demands in the people's movements uh, with that i end my presentation thank you Mansi, um, I think that that was actually quite significant given, you know, the, the nature of uh, what kind of uh, legal discourse kind of binds you to certain forms of uh, one identity, what the state thinks is your identity, especially I think I like the idea of the idea of, you know, the exploding the category of family and what that means. Uh, so um, uh, on to Raghavi and Tanushka. Uh, this paper actually has been written by three people, but two will be presenting. Amukta is uh, grandly sitting over there, but uh, I think <laughs> uh, she will also, I think, uh, answer questions when and if it comes. So over to you. Um, you have about 20 minutes. Uh, a very good uh, evening to one and all. I am Tanushka and uh, this is my colleague Raghavi who we have co-authored with and Nivi has already mentioned about Amukta. So uh, our topic uh, for today's uh, session is familiar publics and public places and how uh, women navigate public spaces uh, with relation to uh, familiar publics. So uh, one of the projects at CBPS is gender violence in public spaces, studying the approaches and theorizing the pathways of change, where we are actually trying to understand the process and mechanics of social change. Uh, so to, uh, the primary focus is basically uh, to, uh, to find out or to explore the creation of safe, sp uh, safe spaces within public spaces. Uh, so for this purpose, we have collaborated with three organizations ac across three states. Uh, so we have collaborated one with Bhumika Women's Collective, which is working for promotion of violence-free lives uh, for women in the states of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. Then we are working with Dusra Dashak in Rajasthan, which is committed to creating change makers within the local com communities through their unique uh, ecological program that provides education to uh, marginalized communities in the various blocks of Rajasthan. And then the, we have also co uh, collaborated with Swati in Gujarat, which is, which is Society for Women's Action and Training Initiative. Uh, which started uh, started as a community based organization but now it's uh, it basically is committed to initiating mass based women movements in rural areas of gujarat so we have been uh, working in uh, uh, the rural areas uh, uh, many rural areas and uh, so the primary uh, uh, the, what we have tried is that we have followed the qualitative methodology where the primary focus have uh, primary focus for data collection has been has been embedded ethnography which has been carried out in the state of Rajasthan and Telangana. And using ethnography, we have not only studied the pathways of the organizational strategies, but we have also recorded the lived experiences of women and adolescent girls by collecting village level uh, data through participation observation, embedded ethnography, village mapping, informal interactions, and oral narratives. Uh, so we have worked with women, adolescents, and men mostly from SC, ST, and uh, backward communities of the rural and the urban field. So over the course of three years, we have mapped, we've not only mapped the activities and strategies of these three organizations working towards social change, 
but we have also studied the living conditions working environment and women's experience with public uh, places and in the process we have re uh, received immense insight uh, about their inner lives and how they deal with violence how they access and assert their presence in public and private places and their perception on politics marriage and other issues like domestic violence education child marriage and uh, etc so in the process of research as we were engaging with the women they have shared experiences lot of experiences uh, with us and throughout the presentation we we'd like to use those those uh, examples and illustrations to make the concept uh, to help uh, in understanding the concept better so to begin with one such experiences of a field mobilizer in one of the uh, fields her name is kamla she is uh, a 34 34 year old woman who had to uh frequently access uh, uh, urban community which is referred to as basti and basically her work was uh, that she had to uh, mobilize the community there she had to create friendly relations with the people who were there in that basti and she was basically the face of the organization and she had to uh, report to the organization about the grand uh, ground realities uh, of the basti so one day uh, uh, and also you know kamla used to interact with a lot of people there so she had to access narrow streets there were uh, places you know where uh, uh, people were there um, who knew her and some who didn't knew her uh, so one fine day kamla had to visit one of the bastis where she had to uh, set up a tailoring uh, free tailoring workshop for the women and um, you so, so she was basically looking for a center and she was unable to find that center in that basti so she kept looking for this uh, center and uh, the she she felt helpless so so she moved out of the basti and there was a street vendor who was standing there so in in need she asked the street street vendor if she could help uh, kamala uh, to kamala surprise the street vendor already knew what work kamala did and why she accessed the field and what she was doing and you know she basically helped kamala find the center so uh, in similar experiences when we were talking about uh, uh, not in similar experiences but when we were talking about such experiences in team meetings so we thought you know uh, we as embedded ethnographers uh, i and raghavi recollected our experiences with the strangers that we had in public places so one such incident is of mine so i was based in rajasthan and i was uh, i had to access the outskirts of jaipur where uh, the i was basically going to bassi block office bassi block and there were a lot of villages which were far from the uh, main city so i had to frequently access that place and one day i was waiting for uh, a bus that went to uh, supposedly village a and i was waiting there and suddenly a bus conductor comes to me and says uh, will you be visiting village b and i just stood there and i said no and i i refused and i i i just politely refused and i stood there and then that said why you always visit uh, village b why are you not going there and to my surprise i was like have i done something so noticeable that he knew my travel routine how does he know my travel pattern i mean what is it that has made him uh, notice me should i should i just change my travel pattern so during team meetings uh, and so no 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 sorry there's one more thing this is my experience raghavi's experience was completely different so we were talking about this and she comes up to me and she, she says that you know you're not the only one who's being recognized by the bus conductor a bus conductor has recognized me also but to my favor they stopped the bus for me because i was running late they knew that i was going to a certain place but they stopped for me but i'm very happy you know i was scared i was sharing that experience with her and she was happy that you know they it was a nice gesture gesture that she felt so uh, during team meetings we couldn't help but notice you know certain people who are actually recognizing our movement and women's movement and you know we actually started di uh, discussing uh, about these things with our advisor and that's when our advisor actually introduced us to the our advisor nivedita menon actually introduced us to the concept of familiar publics so familiar publics are different from the strangers because we repeatedly encounter the familiar public in public places which one accesses frequently the familiar publics are a subset of a general public that has engagement with us that allows us to navigate in public places so this discussion actually pegged our interest and this was something we and women were constantly encountering with so and we actually didn't have the name to refer to it we didn't know who they actually were so we thought of exploring familiar public as concept as people and as phenomena so um, like i mentioned familiar publics are different from strangers because unlike the strangers there is a certain level of engagement and relationship that we establish with the familiar public they are a subset of general public uh, that we encountered repeatedly and are bound to us by a certain level of social reciprocity so the nature of uh, familiar public is such that they are ephemeral and tenuous and to explain this i again have a very nice example to tell uh, so uh, 
in Rajasthan, I had to access one of the villages, uh, which was referred to as Dhanao, and it was some 24 kilometers from Basi, and Basi itself was like 20 kilometers from the main city, Jaipur. So while I was traveling uh, in the bus, I noticed that there were a certain group of women who used to daily access uh, Dhanao in the bus, and there is a lot of short, the, the, the frequency of buses from uh, main city, Jaipur, to Dhanao is just very limited. So the women had no other option. If they didn't board that bus uh, at the right time, the only bus available from Dhanao was late in night. So they didn't have any option. They had to board it. But instead, what the women did was that they actually exchanged their contact number with the bus conductor who was there so that the bus conductor could, could actually tell them the time and the, if the bus was getting delayed due to any reasons and whether the bus was coming to the stops at the right time, uh, right place or not. So in uh, this case, what happened is women have built acquaintances with the conductor to be able to access buses at the right time and place. What happened in this case is that the conductor who was once a stranger has now transitioned into familiar public, providing them the key information regarding their only mode of travel. Therefore, the bus conductor do not become completely known or friends to these women. Rather, both the conductor and women are bound by a circle of social reciprocity. Both the conductor and uh, bo because the conductor encounters them daily and he knows that they are his daily passenger, he too forms a hidden connection to these women. Moreover, these buses are crowded, chaotic and suffocating and trust me it is, I have travelled in these buses. So uh, for women, the presence of their own familiar stranger helps them set a private boundary within the public space and act as their eyes in the public transport. So in this example, we can see that the experience of women with familiar public at public at first was that first the women had no contact with the bus conductor. Over time, the familiarity increased. They started creating relations with the bus conductor to strategize their travel. Uh, this use of familiar publics to travel in the public's uh, place is what we're calling as phenomena. But this phenomena might not be as pleasant as we are stating it because it can be a complete opposite for others. Um, like Krishna mentioned in her slide as well, that you know, uh, first I'll give, give the example, then I'll give her reference. So, um, Again, in one of the fields, there was a girl named Alka. She's a 25 year old, and she used to frequently commute uh, to uh, commute to a place uh, with, with from a similar uh, bus uh, for work. And one such time, um, during interactions, she told us that you know she was so careful about uh, how she how she is presenting femininity and respectability in that bus because the bus conductor actually. Uh, if he does not find any girl in the best behavior, he basically passes on information about girls to the uh, boys that are present in the bus. So she was so scared that the bus conductor will go and give this information about not being in the best behavior to the boys as well as to her brother. And so she, what she used to do is, for her, the best behavior included not putting lipstick and coal. So uh, she's, she, she was constantly afraid of the fact that uh, you know, um, the bus conductor was uh, surveilling her, and because she's doubtful that if he would complain to her brother, she had to, uh, uh, she had to be in, be in her best behavior, and she absolutely um, had limited in, uh, engagement to our. That's what we noticed that she had ex no engagement with the bus conductor, very limited uh, engagement with the bus conductor, and that's where we thought that you know the perception about the person actually forms the perception about the public uh, place that you're there in. Like Krishna also mentioned, you know, about that gangs uh, who were there and how the girls did not want it to go to the melas or fairs, pri primarily because there was the presence of gangs that were there. So the perception about that gang also kind of uh, made the perception about that place. So with all these experiences we have observed, we have learned that there are certain characteristics that uh, help articulate familiar publics, like repetitive interaction in a specific public place, uh, recognition and acquaintance from limited engagement, relations created by women with familiar publics and the reciprocity that they share. So in the process of understanding familiar publics, we have also looked at the literature to see if we can find some, uh, the phenomena there. So we have uh, studied what is called as familiar strangers, which was coined by Stanley Milgram. Uh, so he t so some familiar, familiar strangers are the people who have continuous presence in the public place. So in order to understand women's experience, we have also read Shilpa Fadke's and Shilpa Fadke and other authors' work of a while later. And uh, apart from that, we have also looked at the literature on the street vendors and the women uh, and their uh, experiences in the transport. So with this, what we observed is that the phenomenon of familiar publics is, uh, is, is mentioned very much in these discussions. But, it is, but the name of familiar publics is not used. 
so what we did is we went on further with the experiences that we have collected from the field to define the factors that sorry to identify the factors that define these familiar publics so as i said uh, so uh, we have been telling you beautiful stories and we have few more to tell uh, so these are the experiences that we uh, that the women in the field have experience uh, have and we as uh, researchers had so these so the articulation of familiar publics that are, that is derived from these uh, experience enca encompasses the knowledge and the perception that we and the women share with the particular public place and the people in it so uh, so let me make it clear by giving you referring to the previous example that uh, tanushka was mentioning so kamala who is field worker in one of the uh, urban bastis she accesses these five bastis for her work so these bastis are actually the uh, uh, slums or migrant colonies formed by the people migrated to the city from nearby villages uh, so these these are inhabited by the people who work in an organized sector sorry uh, so um, what happens here is that these are these are also the people from communities such as sc st and bt we all bc and we also find people from muslim and christian communities so kamala very well is very well aware of the places where she can conduct meetings where she has to avoid and these are the the places that she avoids are the places where gangs of uh, uh, which have gangs of men in it so like alluding to the points that are mentioned here again so she constantly avoids these places or she feels apprehensive in accessing the uh, places that are not familiar to her so what we want to tr uh, tell with this point is that her relationship with the public place is defined by her experience her knowledge of that place her knowledge of the people who are inhabiting in that public place hence her uh, articulation of familiar publics is also dependent on uh, the knowledge and the perception she has another important point that we should notice in kamala's uh, case uh, case is that how design of a public place can actually uh, create for lead to formation of familiar publics for example kamala uh, the the streets that kamala uh, accesses are sometimes narrow deserted poorly lit so she often times expressed to me to us that uh, she is comfortable in accessing the places that are uh, that have familiar places so uh, but there are few places in the few places in the basti which were cleared in the name of slum development projects and vertical colonies of apartments were built since these places are cramped of space and there are no presence of, so there is a limited presence of people there she is not so confident in accessing these places um yeah so what we want to say is this the spacious roads the footpaths however broken they may be or the like uh, domestic rest places domestic extensions like extensions like rest places in the streets are the ones that facilitate presence of people in public space if street vendors set up their businesses this allows the presence of more and more people in the public place hence increases the diversity of people accessing that place hence also uh, for makes it uh, makes the women comfortable in accessing those spaces as mentioned earlier familiar publics is a subset of larger Uh, general publics so the question the the questions that tanushka uh, experienced when she was uh, identified by the bus conductors are not worthy among all the travelers why was she noticed why was her travel uh, pattern noticeable was it because of her appearance or is it because of the de urban demeanor that she carries around or is it because of is it because of the denims that she was wearing the bus conductor could also be observing other women so we wanted to understand what are the aspects that made uh, that made few people visible to others and what are the characteristics that form this engagement so what are the uh, yeah, aspects that form this engagement so the social context that these uh, that the women uh, are coming from uh ge like gender class caste this could be anything i'll tell you uh, one fem uh, one example one story of a bina who is a she is a street vendor in front of a school so she actively monitors uh, the behavior of people uh, behavior of students who are in, uh, accessing the space in front of her shop for uh, moral uh, immoral uh, activities like engaging in ro romantic relationships because for her it is moral responsibility to stop such acts
so um, what she told and and she also performs other functions so if if a girl is waiting for someone to be pick uh, for for her parents to be picked her up she bina actually provides uh, shelter to that girl until i mean safe shelter to that girl until she is picked up by her uh, brother or someone at the same time she also uh, shoes away men from her men and boys from her shop uh, thinking that those men are also there to you know uh, form the relationship with the girls so there ha- so bina's attitude are dependent on the gender class and caste that the uh, people who are accessing this public place come from so the point here we would like to mention is that the social context of the actors is what it is defining the f- uh, family or public's action towards this people so like i was mentioning larger public provides anonymity to the people whereas family or public's uh, blood is anonymity anonymity is tied to feeling of safe or unsafe when one is anonymous there is a tendency either to feel safe or unsafe so fp blurs this anonymity so when it blurs the anonymity it helps the women in negotiating the public places through perceived safety when we encounter familiar familiar place in a public place we perceive certain level of safety in alka's case the bus conductor can either be a servant or be a protector of her blurring of anonymity is allowing the surveillance or protection to take happen when there is awareness on certain levels of danger that she might encounter in a public place um, alka might feel protective of bus conductor's behavior but in in this case she is actually feeling surveillance because he was constantly policing uh, the actions of girls who are accessing this space the perception of surveillance or protection also depends on the levels of trust be- built between the people and family or public for example the women who from the now as ha, as we have explained earlier have showed some level of trust towards conductors by sharing their personal contact details whereas in case of tanushka there is the, the such trust is not visible uh, fearing fearing more surveillance from him she had to change her entire travel pattern as discussed earlier uh, as discussed in why loiter women tend to feel more surveillance uh in the in their own neighborhoods so because because there is less anonymity in case of familiar public too because of this less anonymity they tend to feel uh, more surveillance and this often time is uh, reflected as is is shared with us as moral policing because what is seen as moral responsibility by bina is shared is seen as moral policing by the women who are experiencing it beca- because there is constant policing of actions yes it is so we so in conclusion yeah, yeah so in conclusion there is actually no conclusion because we can't say if <laughs> there are this is yeah this is we are exp- because we cannot say if they are safe so women or we cannot actually say if there are safe or unsafe it is entirely based on the perception it is based on the social context in in from which the women are coming it is based on the nature of the public place itself so yeah some might use the- familiar public lo- public to strategize their mobility whereas some might actually avoid them fearing more surveillance so these are the questions that are there in front of us <laughs> like uh so i like to invite sarojini to kind of moderate the next sort of discussion section i would like to sort of uh, open it we have 15 minutes okay well thank you i think uh, very diverse presentations to which actually looked at the way the state provided for or responded to issues yours about the osc and uh, the huge budget gaps and yours about the gaps in the legal definitions and in the implementation and two studies which were far more ethnographic and um, actually looked how things actually play out in the space i i have two or three comments which you can answer at the end but i thought i while i still fresh in my head i would just put them on the table before i open the floor uh, one is that um starting with the last presentation first because it's freshest in my head is that first of all I think this concept is interesting of course i i find personally it will take time for me to absorb the word familiar publics because i think of publics the public public face so i'm just thinking i know the, the other terminology used in other papers 
why you know other people has been familiar strangers i don't know how but i'm just that's something that really hit me but i honestly think that in in the case of this familiar public in in the framework of it's important to also somewhere whenever we look at issues and we've been talking a lot about women it's also to understand how familiar publics to use the word also mediate relationships which may not always be related to with men because it's not you know it's not as if when you're it, 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 somehow you know there is a relationship where familiarity breeds even with men in a certain area and i think it's important to always see I feel women in relation to what's happening to men in terms of when you're looking at outcomes or education or whatever, because if you just see it isolated, you don't get that comparative sort of thing. Uh, the second thing I want to say is, you know, like your own case where you said this happened, maybe he was just asking an innocuous question. So I think this whole issue of not, all, you know, question we need to ask ourselves, is how much enhancement of confidence and thing do we also need for women to face public spaces? Because I think, the, you know, like, I mean, I know when people, they can face. So that was my one question. Uh, I think when I uh, come back to this issue about the, um, um, of the, about the budget allocation, I think this, this uh, there's no question, but I'll leave it open. I think that methodology really works. But I, my question there is, are you, how are you doing advocacy for that data? There's, and uh, when it comes to the uh, issue about the legal framework, uh, I think it really presents a very good example of what I call political haze. You know, trying to give the impression of actually meeting the rights, but when you read between the lines, there's a lot of blurring and confusion. So I'll leave it at that, open the floor, and then maybe you can answer later. So who's to, who's, who would like to ask? And please do indicate who you want or you want to address the question to. Uh, so mine is actually, I'll border from what Mansi you mentioned about uh, legal lang vocabulary failing to address ground reality and pose a question for Tanya. So when you speak, uh, so when we talk about uh, domestic violence, uh, often tenure security is taken away from victim, but the way eviction is read even today, uh, domestic violence victims aren't considered evicted because there's no landlord kicking them out. Uh, leg legally, it's still voluntarily leaving house. So there's still this gap of how you lose your housing rights when you're a victim of domestic violence, but on the legal side, there's no recognition because the uh, like legality doesn't recognize the person having been evicted. And so, uh, so, I mean, how, what was your engagement with uh, loss of housing and like a uh, general uh, legal haze around the whole matter of not recognizing this? I think we should collect a few questions and that will give time, you know. Hello, my name is uh, Harita. Uh, one thing that about Mansi's presentation, when we were talking about trans persons, I felt most of it is uh, related to male to female trans uh, persons, right? I mean, I think it may be useful to remember that because female to male gets invisibilized and they are also, they are not involved in uh, begging and all that. So they are, comp so there is a patriarchy there also where male body getting, uh, you know, greater visibility. That's one. And the second uh, uh, thing is not so much uh, about one presentation, but who gets invisibilized and what kind of uh, perception of men and boys uh, is underlying uh, in these uh, four presentations is uh, what I was thinking. Um, because there is at one level uh, creating awareness and uh, uh, making women question is definitely a step forward. At the same time, if you want transformatory change in gender relations, uh, working with men and also kind of breaking a sort of uh, monolithic image of boys and men and a dialogue around that is also important and how it gets informed 
in this study and inquiry is a reflection rather not really pointing to any other question. Hi. So uh, I have one comment and one question. So I'll raise my comment first. To Mansi's one, uh, the even with the latest Transgender Protection Act, it mentions identity card. And identity card, again, if you go through the, read through the policy, it again mentions you need to have a constant interaction with the bureaucracy, which includes sessions code people, government uh, medical college, so doctors and other health professionals and everyone, which still means you're not even with the idea of self-determination, which is trying to be, you know, pr promoted through an identity card. <clears throat> there is still a right of bureaucracy that goes through, where you have to declare at every stage, you kind of prove yourself against the state that, you know, I identify as a trans person and these are my my, you know, kind quote unquote reasons to identify so. So that was the comment there. And uh, to Krishna was, um, so when you talked about uh, sexual violence and all of it, um, were, we, were you able to look into POXO cases that were, you know, reported in that area? Because you mentioned, uh, you know, abuse from strangers, but if you go through the POXO cases and the kind of analysis that we were able to draw from the cases, there's a lot of family-based violences where most of the abuses are within the family. And in these cases, because your data suggests strangers more, and the POXO case suggests that uh, family members are the pain. So do you think this kind of dichotomy that came across was because of either the you know part uh, the participants or your respondents were not able to uh, publicly talk about it or discuss about it? Or do we think, like, are we, when researchers are researching on these, we missing out on something there? OK, I think we'll stop taking. Okay, last question. My question is to Krishna. According to your findings, 20% uh, of child, uh, uh, data, 20% not uh, were not facing any kind of abuse. Are there, uh, uh, among the 28% uh, uh, belongs to SC or ST or what kind uh, uh, or others? So question to me was about um, how did I engage with the legalese on domestic violence particularly? We did not. We looked at violence in public spaces. Uh, neither did we go into um, describing IPC crimes because that was not the objective of the paper. So that is my short answer. <laughs> when you are asking about the POXO cases, the it, there was a consideration of asking them, but really the girls were not left alone to answer. Like even when they were filling in the tablet, somebody or the other was uh, p keeping a surveillance on them. So we tried, like you know, we tried a lot that uh, you know they shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't be surrounded. In fact, even we did not want to be around them. But it never happened that they were kept alone. So. They were more like talking about the strangers more rather than the people within the family itself or within the cluster itself because such kind of cases happen in the cluster like eve teasing, cat calling and all that also happens over there. So we have witnessed it but they haven't spoken about it. So they don't report it actually. And about the SCST data, yes, we we have, so the party block mostly is about the 86% is OBC and uh, the people have reported that the 20% that they have not faced violence, sexual violence, 76% uh, is the scheduled tribe uh, from Sandrampur block, that is the Maisagar block. So the social composition is there. So the, the others are around 16%, but mostly it is SC, ST and OBC. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, you had mentioned that uh, causing women to leave household is not technically illegal. I was just looking at the DV Act to refresh my memory because it is illegal. If anyone causes a, a woman to leave a shared household uh, through you know means of distress or anything under Section 3D, it is it is an, uh, it is penalized under the Domestic Violence Act. It is also a, an offense under the Trans Persons Act. Um, if you if you cause a trans person to leave their household, this is actually incriminating for uh, you know some of the gharanas or the gurus, in fact, because they may be charged under this uh, section to say that oh you caused them to leave the trans uh, to to leave their household, and so it is in fact incriminating and but this is an important question so thank you for raising that um, so you are uh, absolutely right uh, the 
hijra identity with the one that i actually brought out the most in my paper is actually a uh, uh, male to female trans uh, transitioned uh, you know bodies and they are definitely more glaringly visible as compared to female to male uh, transitions and uh, and there is definitely that hierarchy uh, however having said that um, uh, female to male transition uh, bodies also have in you know, the carry uh, the weight of being having lived in a female body for a long time so that that uh, that interaction with public spaces as someone having previously interacted as a woman or a female in some biological sense still remains so that nuance is actually something that maybe i should try to bring out in my paper so thank you for bringing that up and um, id cards that was you can <laughs> um yeah you're right that the bureaucracy is still there uh, in a big way um however the medical intervention that is required as part of you know applying for the tg card can also just include counseling now most trans persons actually go through gender dys uh, dysphoria uh, for which counseling is actually great and which is actually covered under the ayushman uh, bharat scheme now so um, yes you're right the bureaucracy is still there in terms of like being applying to the dm who often rejects if they don't know the uh, the the act or how to implement it um, but in some ways it's also great that they are getting counseling as part of medical interventions which is required thank you yeah, we actually didn't have any question but to like sir was mentioning about including men and women boys so i'll and just say something sorry. very quickly just just to say you know uh, in india just now there's not but one of the big debates that's going on just to take on from you is one thing is when you actually have a sex change and you go from being male to woman but now the definition of gender which is being vastly accepted is that you just have to think that you are. So one of the big debates that's going on overseas is basically around the fact that you can think you are actually a male body, you haven't had a sex change, but you think you are a woman. You, the big debate I saw when I was going in England is does that woman go into the women's cell in the prison or does she or he, I don't know how to put it, does she, he use which toilet? And there was a big debate going on because there was also this debate of the other side, you know, people are again dominating and they may be predators. So I'm just telling you that this is a very, very complex, we haven't got to that yet, but it is part of the debate uh, thing. The other thing I just want to quickly say, because just to, is that you see, when you're doing gender responsive budgeting, what you did, Tata, Tanya? Yeah, Tanya. Tanya did, and she picked up just one scheme. I mean, and that's totally valid. What I'm trying to say is when you do gender-responsive budgeting, you can choose a scheme, you can choose a sector, you can choose the whole government budget. So just finding out gaps, it can be done for absolutely anything. So so I'm, I'm just saying that it's, it's, it's a totality in itself. You don't then look at the whole issue of violence against women. And the last thing I just want to say is that, uh, and I did mention it in the slide, but this whole issue of involvement and bringing in men and boys, which you alluded to, to, I think is critical to the whole change of, of uh, you know, changing within institutions, because what you need is changing the way people think and do things. So I'll just stop. Like we were also planning to explore what men and adolescent boys experience with familiar publics and how their safe uh, perceptions of safety and safe and unsafe does comes in, in a, so that's the next thing to explore in our paper. We have uh, exciting high tea waiting for all of us, um, but I'd like to actually because this is something that I've been working with in the last three years. I've um, I have about, we have worked on public spaces and definitions of public spaces for, you know, now I'm sleeping, eating, reading, uh, everything, public space. But so I, I really want to collect my thoughts together so that I also would like some conversations going forward to all of the people who are here, because I know there are a lot of people here who have been working primarily on public spaces and gender, and I'd like to have these conversations brought forward. One is, I think, from basically from the first panel that we spoke about, there is a conversation that we need to have about what that, you know, when we have a perception of public space, there is, I think, also a post truth, which I think uh, Professor Vergis spoke about. There's a, there is a reality out there which I think is stranger than 
than one believes in. For example, I, I bring, I, I'll tell another story, I'm sorry, I'll take two minutes. In Hyderabad, actually, um, Jyotsana and I had gone um, to a meeting, and uh, while this meeting was being conducted, imagine the space, okay? So you have, like, uh, there's, a, there is a, um, there's a mosque and there is a temple, which nowadays, where do we find that? Uh, and there's a there's a street. There, it's two common streets, and there is the basti. The basti. You know, all of us who've been to bastis know that there is no kind of wall, and then the then the house starts. Right, the wall is the house, and then there is a what you call in Malayalam. There's a padi. So there is that uh, step or a slab. Correct. Now that's not really. You know, you would not consider that a uh, private space. But there was this woman who was there the entire meeting. This really loud, uh, you know, like this ch children's meetings. You can imagine how loud it was, right? It's active, and this there is like cows going, and the autos are going, and she is taking a pillow, and she has she came out of the house, she took a pillow, and she slept there, right? She slept on that slab, right at that space. Now we have campaigns in Bangalore, you might know, where you take blankets out to parks and sleep in public places as a way of reclaiming, reclaiming that, right? So inviting risks, as Shilpa Fatke says. But the thing is that woman was doing that right there. She wasn't part of any campaign. She was just, she was in public space and she was sleeping and she was soundly sleeping. And I, I can tell you very honestly, I cannot do that outside my house. There's a whole social identity and a social class that is attached to that kind of space. So what I'm trying to say is that when we say about, okay, we have to claim social spaces and we have to claim public spaces, we are. Women are claiming public spaces, just not in the ways that we see them. And it's, the violence is real, right? So you can see it, like you can see it in numbers, you can see it in stories, you can see it in any number of ways. At the same time, there are women who are engaging with this. We, they, are, they are inviting risk in their day-to-day -day lives, not necessarily because they want to, but they have to, but they also engage because they want to, because that's another thing that perhaps we might miss out in a conversation of public spaces, but was very definitely articulated in the first panel, is that public spaces are also of, uh, and actually of, uh, Sarojini also mentioned it, is of leisure is of joy, is of pleasure. I mean, if you speak to all of the, all of us who've been working in public spaces, women seek public spaces for joy, for, you know, we enjoy being out. We enjoy the areas that we are. So one of the things is also a politics of joy, pleasure. I mean, when we talk about um, uh, the legalese of it, that some, some of that can be, and, and, and Claiming sexuality. So one of the comments that I had for Mansi was, you know, when sexuality is so open, um, openly contested in the transgendered body, it also pays, I mean, what it does is it also erases our sexuality that we are unable to express, you know, cisgendered sexuality that we are unable to express because there, the thing is, the truth is that the public space is actually also a lens into our own social mores, right? It is our performance in public spaces is actually telling the world who we are, and that could be our hor horrendous, oppressive selves, right? That, that could be us, and that's, for us, I mean, I, I, what I'm uh, asking is an invitation to examine public spaces is also an invitation to ask what we believe in, who we are, because what we perform in public spaces is really what our politics are, right? So when we do not claim uh, buses at night, when we do not go in buses at night, we, when we self-police and come home at 9 p.m., we're also making other women much more vulnerable at the same time, right? So the, the action of making us safe is making others unsafe. Uh, and so that's a politics that we must embrace in some ways, right? That, the, that what we're performing is, is really talking about who we as a society, what we are representing. And so then the second thing then is about how money matters. And oh my God, Tanya, you, you must do this much more. Uh, is um, We need to create accountability. And the thing is, apart from the critique that I actually had for your paper, uh, around you know how, what's the sort of you know implications with respect to what one-stop centers, whether they are being used, blah, 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 th there is, an accountability and governance that mechanism that actually must matter. And the third point, and I'll end with this, is uh, really about, uh, you know, we, um, I mean, I really 
like your point about you know not monolithic ideas and i think the monolithic ideas can come from any place right so patriarchy not being a monolithic idea um, men not being a monolithic idea um, vulnerabilities not being a monolithic uh, violence not being a monolithic idea so i think moving away from one is to embrace intersectionality as you know sarojini has spoken about the other is to engage with diversity as one of the comments you know said one is to engage with that uh, but also i think um, as a researcher, I think it's just, you know, we don't have enough to say um, more. And I think that's really, we need data. <laughs> we need data very badly. We don't have enough. And so I feel like it's also uh, an invitation for all of us who are interested in public spaces, if we can come together in some form or fashion, because the government at the moment is not collecting, right? And uh, uh, and someone said that we can't even trust some of it. So we need, uh, we need data because I think for us it's a, if I'm saying that our performance in public spaces is about who we are, our data is also reflecting about what we need, what it is that we absolutely need. And I'll go back to what Sarojini has been saying since the morning, is that we do not have an articulation of what women actually do and what women want. I think both of those things are critical. And I think uh, in our daily experiences, what we do and what women want is something that we should keep front and center. And I thank you all for your uh, patience and for listening patiently to all of our presentations. And thank you all for your comments. And please be in touch with us. We are here located. We are celebrating our 25th. Please be in touch with us if you're interested or want to work much more in gender and public spaces. Thank you.